know, I, I went to school for landscape architecture. Um, I'm a green roof professional. Um, GRP is a designation that you can get. Um, I was one of the first to get that in uh, North America. Also uh, specialized in uh, shoreline restoration. Um, been, in Habitech was founded in 2013, I've been, but I've been doing green roofs in the industry since um, very, oh, now it's 16 years. I haven't updated this at the, this point. And in that time, I've played a role in over a thousand green roofs from coast to coast, across the country, South America, um, Europe, all over the place. I used to work for one of the largest manufacturers in the industry. So I really cut my teeth there and moved home uh, to Traverse City um, about five years ago. Um, I also helped with a lot of policy education. I wrote a lot of policy and was hired by the industry um, trade association to help write policy development or, um, documents. So uh, the focus on uh, building more green roof markets across North America and helping cities. Um, I helped everything from, you know, I've, I've consulted with Traverse City all the way to New York City, Washington DC, all, all over the country, San Francisco, Portland, Oregon, Austin, Texas. Um, and help them put together their green infrastructure and stormwater policies and incentive programs to help grow the industry in that marketplace. Um, so in Habitat, we're a full service firm devoted to designing, building, and growing all forms of living architecture. So I'm gonna show you a little, uh, four different projects that we've done. Uh, they're all connected in one, in, in, in one way or the other in Traverse City. Uh, but green roofs, rain gardens, rainwater harvesting, rain barrel type stuff. Uh, permeable paving, living walls, natural shorelines, native plants, as well as habitat restoration. Those are all the things that we're doing. We tie it together and become the expert from concept through completion for you, one-stop shop type stuff. Um, so that's what I'm basically showing here, initial planning through plant establishment. Um, we're working with architects, landscape architects, engineers, developers, contractors, schools. We'll tell you a little bit about a project that we're doing here. Um, with Jen here at N uh, right on campus, um, nonprofits as well. I work. That's I'm finding that's a you know a great opportunity here locally, and this that type of collaboration is really working out for those parties. Work directly with homeowners as well, um, and other building owners, and then community uh, stakeholders, decision makers. Um, I'm, I'm working with that um, all all different levels. So first one, uh, you know, uh, the, you saw the watershed center of Grand Traverse Bay mentioned you know before these are another uh, group of projects um, that they they're doing um, focusing on restoring kids creek there um, and i'm lucky enough to be um, in that group and you know there's a lot this has been going on for over uh, 15 years um, i don't work for them or i'm not affiliated with them but um you know we're work very closely um, i you know i live right right by where all this is all happening um, and the stuff uh, highlighted in red are the projects that we are going to show you, or I'm going to show you today that Inhabitech has been a part of. The first was two rain, two, two rain gardens at Cottage View Drive, which is uh, the Grand Traverse Commons. I don't know if you guys have been to Building 50 and stuff in Traverse City. It's the old um, uh, psych hospital that, psychiatric hospital that's right next door to Munson Medical Center. It's all right there on the tributaries and all on the, um, you know, it, it's really close to Kids Creek. So we did two rain gardens there. Also another one right across the street, which is at, um, at the state, state of Michigan office building. Um, those are all last year. Um, other ones are two different green roofs on Munson's campus, uh, Munson Medical Center's campus, um, one at the new cancer center, and another one on, over, on what's called Northwest Tower A, which is uh, right over their MRI unit. So restoring Kids Creek here. Um, let me see if I can find. This is uh, prior to them starting. You can see that the the stream came was basically was daylighted over here, but then went in a pipe, ran down here, and then was daylighted again down here. So there was a large part of it that was underground for about a hundred years, um, and then they they the the. Um, they wanted to do the restoration here in Munson, um, being a great organization that they are, they put together the funds to buy out all these businesses and they daylit this one. This is so you can see here, they built this and it's pretty awesome. There's video, I believe you might know, 
uh, down. And I think it was within 24 or 48 hours, they found brook trout that were already in that part of the stream after they opened it up. So, and I used to live in this house right there. And I used to go back here and there'd be salmon and steelhead and everything in there. Um, so it, it's pretty cool. And, but on, on top of this, you know, so that was the first step. Now they're adding all this different green infrastructure upstream of this. So they're doing green roofs, infiltration trenches, all kinds of stuff. Um, and one of the first ones pretty high up in this tributary was um, this one here, which is at the old site, at, at, built at the Grand Traverse Commons. You can see the old historical structures there. Um, it was with AECOM. Um, you know, overall, it was, um, it was an area that was a little different than a lot of the stuff. This one, we couldn't infiltrate here. Um, at this location because the soils, they did soil borings and they found out that the soils were contaminated and they wanted to, um, or very, you know, this was lower contamination rates than they find they found around this area. But they, they so we actually put a membrane and I'll show you in the detail, but this one was, we actually put an impervious membrane underneath this and these, you know, they catch the water and they move it down systematically into an infiltration location further away. But what this is, is it is capturing and slowing down the water and it's um, evaporating a lot of the water prior to moving down. Um, so it was a designated brownfield area, so that's why, why we, we needed to put this membrane that you see right here. Um, this is the location, you can see the one that we, um, I showed you a picture of where you saw the membrane is this. Um, and then there was another one here. So the water comes from these parking lots and moves into this parking lot and then jumps down to this one. And then it goes in a pipe down to other stuff on the other side of these buildings that are there. Um, just a, a, a note of like, as we're working, you know, it's always interesting working in locations like this. Like we had to, there's a tunnel under here. So we had to be careful where we put our machines, you know, so we don't collapse a tunnel and fall eight feet or 10 feet below into the tunnel that was built in 1845 or whatever it is. So it's a historical part of all of this. Um, we found fiber op optic cable they forgot they ran, you know, like it was a lot of, um, a lot of hurdles um, on this one, but we got through and we adjusted it and um, made it work. Um, and you can see here, it's a very similar under drain system that uh, Don had showed earlier, uh, but it, the thing that to notice is the membrane that goes underneath it. So, um, so that this is us putting that membrane in. You can see that, and actually, if you look at this, um, there it's a pretty. There's no shape to this. If you look at the original design, they had wanted to keep this tree, but um, the tree was dead, so they chose to, uh, while we're digging all this up, they decided just to make the basin a little bigger. And um, so that's what we did. Um, and, you know, it was uh, an interesting site to work because it was full of people. They couldn't, the people live there, there's offices. So it was a very tight site to be driving a machine like this around. And luckily we got through without opening any cars like can openers. <laughs> You know, because this the machine, and you know, it, so it was a challenge there. But we got, you know, we got through it. Um, and you can see the under drain going in here, and then after the under drain, putting the gravel drainage layer on top of there, and then the uh, the rain garden soil there. Um, and here it is planting, setting out the plantings. Um, then we put down a, a drainage or a uh, erosion control blanket on top of there with a specialized seed mix, native seed mix and then uh, mulched it and planted the plants there. So the other one that I was talking about, um, over at the downstream a little bit from this, um, it's at the State of Michigan office building. <coughs> um, it was again a collaboration between the Watershed Center of Grand Traverse Bay and AECOM. Um, they're a team that's managing most of this, um, the overall restoration. Um, and you know, this again is on Kids Creek and it's uh, designed to manage storm water from a large parking area that you can see here. Um, lots of cars there um, coming in and out. Um, this was built, this was um, supposed to catch all the debris before it goes in. Uh, there is under drains and an overflow, and back here is a natural wetland. So um, again, it, it, this one um, is, is to slow the water down, but also infiltrate it. 
Um, and it was a sh more shady condition, so the plants were a little bit different there than the previous one I showed you. Um, no membrane underneath and very um, dense plantings. Um, this was, this project here was, there was another huge bioswale and rain garden that was on the other side of the parking lot to manage an even greater amount of the water coming off a different section of parking lot. But um, as budgets, you know, Don had talked about, you know, projects, things get cut on a regular basis. Um, and that, that one was decided that would be a phase two down the road. And they're actually um, hopefully raising, they're, they're supposed to be raising funds for that as we speak. Um, so here are some construction projects it might be hard uh, pictures. It's hard, sort of hard to see, but you know, basically it's this one had very deep. I mean, we're talking in some areas four feet of the rain garden mix. So when you see this after, you know, if you just walk by, it looks like a landscape bed. Um, now it's so grown in, but it's, it's really, um, it can hold a large volume. Um, so I'll jump over to the, um, the uh, Cowell Family Cancer Center. You can see this, the tributary here, or the uh, Kids Creek. Um, there was an empty lot in that other image I showed you where the creek had been started, and they built this um, large cancer center there. Um, this is the one that, um, you know, tongue in cheek say, this is the kind type of, this is the green roof you, hopefully you never see up front, because there's only one reason you'd be there. And, um, but the reason it's there, is because this is all infiltrate. This all of this is where the infusion units are. So one of the main goals of this was this green green roof was not only to manage stormwater, but it was also to give a healing garden. So people are see that you know that they they're there. They have you know they're they're battling for their lives, but they're there and they're looking out over plants. They they can go out and there's benches and everything out here. They can go out and enjoy the outdoors in a peaceful environment, in a private environment. Their family members are there. So this is a huge social aspect of why this one was built. Plus it added to the whole, um, I guess, uh, you know, group, uh, like I call it arrows, arrows in the quiver, you know, they're, they're stacking the deck here and they're getting, they're, they're really, all this water that's hitting here is not gonna make it down there, or at least it's slowed down and cooled down. Um, so there's three different roofs, three different distinct areas, about 3,300 square foot of green roof, and about the same amount of pavers um, there. And those those pavers are something that are on a lot of green roofs that make that's so you can get out there and you can use that space. Um, a lot of projects now um, to increase the um, water holding capacity of these rooftops is actually blue roof, which was. Um, a newer thing, it's getting out there, and that's another one to add to the bag of options here. And it's actually a, a, a chamber underneath uh, pavers or green roof. That you, it's basically a big cistern, a horizontal six inch tall cistern that covers the whole rooftop. Um, so that's another thing that I'm seeing being used and specified in areas like that um, have CSOs. Um, here's some close-up or larger formatted images. Um, underneath here is actually their um, radiation area, and that's one reason this green roof um, could be there with all of these people. The density of people you can have one person per square foot on this roof is because those the ceiling is five feet thick because it's um, it's basically five feet of lead almost. Um, but they wanted they, they had this really strong roof, you know, and they wanted to do something. So that's this that there's a whole story behind it. Um, we were involved from top to bottom on it. Um, but you can see this space here. So um, great view, um, cool roof. Um, another one. Um, this one is different. It's not accessible at all. Um, but all of these, again, the all of these people in all this area, they can, they look out over this. It was a really dirty white membrane, you know, stained with all the sediments that fall out of the air. Um, and now they look at this and it's, there, there's bird, there's uh, the killed deer out there making nests and there's animal, you know. So people are seeing this stuff while they're sitting in their hospital room. Um, 
my grandmother actually was in one of these units here and my you know they they I went there and you, I could see how great it was. My whole family, I'm probably a little biased because I installed it, but they they loved it because they were looking out and they like following the animals that are coming and going, or the birds at least. Um, so this one, and this is one of many, they, um, they're searching for more roofs on this campus and they're actually building a huge women and children's hospital there that's gonna be filled with green roofs once that's uh, built. So, and then quickly, I'm just gonna burn through a few more of these because I'm way ahead of time. Some that are, this one's here in Emmett County, um, uh, over at the Boynton City City Hall. They have some green roof there, as well as some pavers. Um, you can all visit this one. I'm sure it's right off of their main meeting room. Um, so a project that I'm working on um, with Jen um, and collaborating with uh, the school here, the college here is, um, it's a small uh, 800 square foot uh, demonstration green roof. It's gonna be right over here. Um, I think you can almost see it. It's right over there by the Iron Horse Cafe, the entrance to the cafe over there. It's gonna be the roof right above there. Um, and this is going to be, this is part of the Little, Grand Tra or Little Travers Bay Watershed Green Infrastructure Initiative. Um, and uh, we're gonna work with the, the students here as well as the professors to come up with a program to educate them about green roof technologies and hopefully um, in, implement some monitoring to this uh, for sto uh, storm water, soil moisture, heating and cooling, and potentially the temperature, ambient temperature above the roof. So th these are things that can be actively going on. Um, you know, the monitoring is still in question if the funding, um, you know, if we're gonna be able to afford that, but um, that hopefully is something that can be used. And then you're gonna have, if that's available, then that data is available to any of you to see how it's reacting to the, you know, the annual rainfall that's falling, um, hitting right here. Um, and that's really valuable to the whole industry, really, to have these pockets of monitoring is what's really helping grow the green roof market because you can go and you can take this data and it's potentially useful to Don or to you know somebody like to other entities. Um, so this hopefully will be um, being we're aiming for a, a fall 2018 installation on this. Um, this is something that I really am passionate about is educating um, students. I educate K through you know where whatever wherever you guys are put into that spectrum. You know, I go into little, you know, teach little kindergartners and first graders about what green infrastructure is. And I do that uh, and do a lot of outreach. That's part of my passion of this is to educate as many people as possible. And this is giving an opportunity for that. Um, just a couple more real quick, um, since we have a little bit more time. Um, unless, Jen, do you have any more you want to add on that? No, that, that sums it up. Okay, um, this is the GSA building that's at in Sault Ste. Marie. If any of you have dr driven over to Canada and come back, this is the border crossing station. Um, don't let them know that I put pictures up there. They might come after me, but they, but you can see everyone lining up to get back in the country there. Um, they put this roof up there for um, some of their own, you know, one of it, it's sort of a status symbol, and, and, but also they manage water and the heating and cooling. This is a shallow or a shorter roof. It's only about 30 feet high. There's not a lot of windows. I mean, and, and this helps with the heating and cooling in this building. Um, it's about 22,000 square foot. Um, it was installed um, when I worked for a previous company. I oversaw and helped engineer all of this. There's some pretty steep slopes here, um, but we currently maintain it. Um, we go there once a month in the growing season. Um, and we get up there and we make sure it looks how it looks here. Um, and we, we, the things, this is, now it's been installed, it's almost eight years old. Um, so like in that eight years to see the maturity and like the things that happen with it, these things are dynamic living systems. Um, for one, there was one section of the roof that was just dead and we couldn't figure it out. Um, you know, I did soil tests and nutrient tests and all type, you know, all types of things. And then it was just this one area and it was sort of circular shaped and large and then one day I got there before the sun came up and there's a light pole that's right about where this picture was taken right behind me 
and they had these huge halogen lights on it, like 15 or 20 of them that are on all night long. And these plants, could, they, they couldn't survive that. They're constantly in light. So just the interesting challenges I find myself in. Then I had to petition General Service Administration and all these other who knows people in DC to be able to get them to shut the lights off so that their green roof would live. And amazingly, they shut some of them off and it's doing better now. So like, the strange things I find myself in, and I never thought I'd be talking to whoever runs the, that, this segment of the General Service Administration, you know, hundreds and hundreds of buildings. And, uh, but yeah, you have to have security clearance and everything to get into this one. It's a, an interesting one. Um, another one in Traverse City, this one is, uh, you can see here, this is a great example of a, a business sort of providing a space for their employees. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty small company. Um, they're a food distribution uh, warehouse, but they're really dedicated to being green and local and giving a really good work environment. So they created this outdoor sitting space where this is their main office is in there and people can walk outside. Anytime I go there, they're on their cell phones, they're on their tables and chairs doing, the, doing emails out there excuse me, emails out there. Um, this, and there's two areas of intensive, that's the deeper green roofs, um, where they can plant vegetables. So everyone, they have a community garden at work and people go out there and pick lettuce and a tomato if it's in season and have a salad that they watched grow. And all this interaction between employees is, is huge. Um, and um, so that was, that was a pretty fun one. Um, and then you go to urban condos. This is right on the Boardman River in downtown Traverse City. It was a really small, dense development. And we utilized um, green roofs here to help reduce the amount of stormwater that was going to be leaving this site. We actually decreased, or we decreased the volume from what it originally was, but we also increased the quality of the water leaving this site because the water from here and goes down into different um, rain gardens and other types of um, treatment before it hits the river. Um, so then and when they were digging this place up, it was a former dump. Um, it was a brownfield site. Um, when they were digging for the basements and the footings and everything, they were digging up old Model A's, and model, like teeth, like old shoes from who knows when, and ink wells, and whiskey bottles from 1875, and all kinds of stuff. Um, so it was an improve. Yes, it, 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 this not only improved that site because it cleaned up the brownfield. It put uh, fifteen eight hundred thousand dollar to a million and a half dollar condos on the tax rolls for the city. Um, so at the corner of uh, Pine State, right? Pine State, yeah. I know they have rain gardens at Yeah, they have rain gardens at so Yeah, it's crazy expensive, I know, but. To have that much money packed into a little area for the city is a big opportunity. And um, the one way they got to do the density, as you can see this here, they actually allow people to pass through and gain access to a boardwalk they built. And this connect, there's connectivity now for the boardwalk all the way through there um, to other city-owned docks and everything. So overall, they tried to really improve the site, build a little beyond what was at, you know, allowed by um, or the city ordinance, but in the end, the sit, everyone wins. Um, the community, because there's cleaner water leaving that site. Um, the, the owners here have the green roofs they can go up onto. Most of them have elevators. They can go right up to the, all, the, all of them have elevators. That's why they're in the price point they are, but they can go up to the rooftop and they have gardens, they have the green, they can have great views and then the city is then gaining more tax. Um, so this is just quickly, um, I have five more minutes. Um, just, you know, this is the technical term for the industry of what a green roof is. Um, and there's different names for green roofs depending where you're at in the country. Um, here are the green roofs, they're vegetative roofs. In other areas, living roofs in California, eco roofs in Oregon, it's pretty interesting. Um, the local markets dictate that, but it's all above a watertight man-made structure is, um, is a technical term. And, you know, really my, you know, my pitch here is like, you know, their value-added infrastructure option. Um, and I think, you know, they, we have a little bit of differing 
John and I have a little different view, but it's still all for the better of, and the good, you know, here. And I think that you know, the economic, environmental, and social benefits are, um, you know, both in the public and private sector are um, really unmatched with other types of stormwater management um, when you compare it dollar to dollar. Um, because a green roof not only manages water, but it grows food, you know. So there's all different types of things that you can think about. And it doesn't need, um, additional land to provide that provide that growing space um, and you know it can be retrofit or new construction too so it's really flexible a lot of older buildings um, you know the city is um, similar age as Traverse City um, so a lot of the structures downtown are likely built like really it's either it's night and day usually with the older structures they're either built for two or three more floors or they barely can hold the snow load I mean it's, it's hit or miss but um, a lot of times buildings can be retrofitted um, to have the green. So here's my contact information. Um, I can answer questions. Have yeah. you managed um, storm water um, with a parking structure? Yeah, definitely. Um, actually, one of the projects that was shown earlier, um, the big flat one, it was of a green roof, was a parking structure in Seattle. Yeah. And that was built for that. That was, uh, the, you can look that one up. I helped. Bill Gates. Bill Gates, a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation garage. I helped sell that one. Uh, I took that picture while standing on the yeah, space needle. Yeah, the space needle is a perfect place to see that one. Um, yeah, so that, yes, is definitely. Is that tied to the storm system then and not sanitary? Uh, yeah, depending on the city you're in. You know, um, the um, in Portland, Oregon, let's say, they, we've done, I've done a couple there like that, and they, they make it, any water coming from the green roof they pass through a sand filter that then goes into the uh, storm system. Okay. There's a parking garage the, uh, in downtown Detroit that's actually the parking structure for a couple of medical buildings and some other stuff, and they put a green roof on top of that with a running track. So it's Blue Cross Blue Shields headquarters. So they, they you know, that, that people go up there for the running track, and they say that's a, the dual use kind of thing we were just talking about. Yeah. And then there's a parking, uh, uh, there's a parking structure in Dearborn that the overflow then goes into cisterns that are in between kind of the footings. So the parking structure's got the, the deep footings. Well, in between, they actually then have water being stored. So they actually are storing the water. That was a CSO area. So they're storing the water, infiltrating what they can, but then slowly releasing the rest. To storm. What? Can they release it to storm? But, and that because that's a CSO, they're they're releasing the sanitary, but they're releasing it very slowly, which helps take the load off right, the wastewater right. treatment plant. But right. whatever's on the green roof doesn't get into the sanitary. That stays up. That stays yeah. out totally. And, and the big and for a CSO zone, the, one of the huge reasons why green roofs are um, so incentivized in places like in old cities that have CSOs that are hard to disconnect, like Philly or DC, is because they want to delay that. They want to delay the peak flow. Right. So you're getting that you're getting that delay, and then you're behind the storm. So then they let you infiltrate or or dump into the into the system two or three hours after. Sometimes it's um, you get a control what's called a control flow drain too, and that control flow drain doesn't release for 24 or 48 hours, and then it only does it at a certain gallons per minute or gallons per hour. So there's a lot of ways of, around that that it, and that. That's a whole, that slow release is a whole, uh, you know, with a control flow drain, that market is slowly picking up and becoming more uh, popular. Um, and then real quick, I know we're right on time here, just to show you some more quick uses of green roofs. This here is, um, I'm, I took this picture uh, from the 14th floor of a high rise. This is the parking garage underneath here. Well, this is a community garden, barbecue area, Right here, there's actually a fire hydrant for dogs to go to the bathroom on the rooftop, and it, we had to create, uh, we had to connect to sanitary there. I believe, like, so that was a last. On, on, we didn't consider that. That was Portland, and then these are condos right here. Um, Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Here, this is a subway entrance. Um, it's a green roof, um, but it's at grade. Um, this is a, a hospital um, with a lot of green roof here. It's very tall prairie grasses in South Carolina. The American Society of Landscape Architects in uh, Washington, D.C. This is their um, headquarters. This is the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. They actually have um, solar panels around the, the whole outside. 
This is their biodome. If you ever get out there, you should definitely go to this place. It's awesome. They have an albino alligator. I like that one the most. But um, the uh, and then this here is private condos in uh, Boston. They're, each of these are private condos, and there's a, a penthouse up top that has a retractable pool, a roof on a pool, and everything overlooking the Boston Harbor. But um, yeah, those are all projects that I, you know, I came back to Michigan. I, that's what I used to do. But uh, yeah, that's uh, the, so a lot of experiences and a lot of different options out there. And, um, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.